Good evening. And greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And greetings to you on behalf of the 110 worshiping communities that are the Episcopal Church in Middle and North Georgia, the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. We are brought together tonight here at the cathedral and around the diocese through live streaming by the members of the beloved community, the Commission for Dismantling Racism. These courageous and insightful men and women have gathered us so that we might be in compliance with the General Convention Resolution of 2006, which invites us to, quote, make a full, faithful, and informed accounting of our history, including the complicity of the Episcopal Church in the sin of slavery, segregation, discrimination, and their aftermath, end quote. Tonight is the Diocese of Atlanta once more taking up the work of being the beloved community. And to accomplish this work, our first commitment must be to look back together. I had to deal with race because here I am living in this black body, being a woman and living in a world that wishes I hadn't come here. God would not have us to be blind to who we have been. After I met with them, met with the vestry and went out to dinner with the wardens, the next day they called the bishop and said, we don't want any women and we don't want any black clergy to be considered. Or what we have done to each other. We got a relationship with the Diocese of Kimberley and Kuruman. The representation that was sent over to the Diocese of Kimberley Kuruman did not include any black people at all. And if you will recall that the state of Georgia's flag had the Confederate flag on it, they showed uh, a video of their time over there presenting the flag. And so, you know, we got on the floor of convention and said, this makes absolutely no sense. You're presenting a flag that has the Confederate battle flag on it, which represents segregation, which represents oppression, right? Plus, you don't have anybody black. <laughs> just the opposite, in fact. Just the opposite. In the 2016 election, probably about 60% of my parishioners voted for Trump. So I invited Catherine Meeks. And then I insisted that all of the different classes we had on Wednesday night focus for three weeks after that on talking about the issues of racial discrimination and racial healing that Catherine had brought to our attention. The resistance from parishioners was unbelievable. And over the next year, our young adult, young family program basically disintegrated. The parish itself suffered from it, if you look at the parish as an institution. But the parish became a far more godly place. We've got to look back, but we look back as the beloved community and to look back as the beloved community is to see through the lens of repentance, to see the times when we have not loved the Lord or our neighbors with our whole heart, to look back through the eyes of reconciliation, that what was lost is now found, what was dead is now alive, and in the words of the prayer book now, your sins are forgiven. I was reminded just a couple of hours ago about how poignant this service really is. 51 years ago, the newspapers reported that Dr. King's son was refused admittance to the, to the Lovett School, which was then housed on this campus. And the then bishop, he refused to issue a statement about race, even at Coretta King's begging and that he decided that he would uphold the policy of segregation and that his only statement for the newspaper was that, quote, 
He was interested to know why a Baptist would want to go to a school with Episcopalians, end quote. And it might interest you to know that I have Bishop Claiborne's vestments on underneath the chasuble tonight that I'm wearing as a poignant symbol that we can rewrite history together. And you might also be interested to know that it was a white priest, Father Morris, who took on Bishop Claiborne and challenged him to desegregate our schools in the diocese and our parishes. And you might be interested to know that it was that white priest, Father Morris, who ultimately lost his license to be priest in this diocese. So deep was his commitment. We tell the truth, not in anger, not against people, but we tell the truth because the truth has to be told because the truth gives life. And so the truth of it was is that we were on the wrong side of things then. But now with that garment on uh, me as I preach this, uh, I think an open-handed sermon uh, to people going forward, uh, we got a chance to rewrite the script. And I think that's what Jesus is about. He's not about denying the wounds. He's about framing new life through the lens of we have wounded each other and now we have to go ahead, resurrected and made whole. We'd gone to a, a campus in Philadelphia, believe it or not, uh, maybe early on being the bishop, and he realized that, and he saw what was going on in some of the schools up there and um, re realized that we did have uh, many colleges in this diocese, and especially in Atlanta. So he just decided that Atlanta needed to have a, a center which involved a, a racial healing. Where the Canterbury Center now, or Absalom Jones Chapel at Canterbury Center is now, that was started, um, the planning for that um, started right when I was leaving. Let me just say this, that the Canterbury Center was uh, important during the Civil Rights Movement because SNCC used to meet at the Canterbury Center because uh, Warren Scott was sort of like uh, a mentor to a lot of the students uh, at the Atlanta University Center who were involved uh, in the civil rights movement. Interestingly enough, a lot of people didn't know that there was an Episcopal chaplaincy at the Atlanta University Center. And even more than that, a, a lot of people in the diocese didn't even know anything about the Atlanta University Center which I thought was quite interesting. I went to a mass house in February or March of 1970 as part of the planning for Andy Young's campaign and met Austin Ford and met the women who were part of the welfare rights movement that were based at a mass house. This is when I began to understand the deep commitment of the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta to racial justice in the city. I mean, Austin was leading protests and demonstrations of people in that community with the full support of the Episcopal Diocese. You know, they would march to the state capitol. They would take buses of black kids from poor communities to white schools that should have been integrating but weren't. And one of the things on our agenda uh, as uh, the Union of Black Episcopalians was to push for a canon to the uh, ordinary as well as a canon at the cathedral because we said that with Atlanta being a majority city black at that time that the Episcopal Church was not really um, representative of the population, the demographics in the diocese. It was good working with Frank Allen. I did, had never lived in the South before and uh, had not experienced 
didn't know what I was going to experience when I was going down there. I had come, I'd been rector in Indianapolis and I had gone down to Atlanta to work with him. And when I went, just before I got there, two clergy in his diocese renounced their orders and became Roman Catholic because it was the same time Barbara Harris had been elected bishop. She hadn't been consecrated yet, but she'd been elected. And I was coming, and when I got there, there were parishes that would not let me come. They told the bishop, you know, I do not want her at my parish. When, when I became bishop, I, uh, in some sense, inherited a, a program, but it's interesting how it kind of corresponded with emphases of the General Convention. Because uh, the General Conventions in 2003 and again in 2006, and I believe again in 2009, all emphasized um, uh, the work of anti-racism at various levels and began to put uh, requirements in place. In 2006, the General Convention passed a resolution that was very comprehensive and caused, called for us to be looking into uh, why our country and how our country had played such an important role in actually, we weren't calling it white supremacy in those days, but um, we were beginning to really recognize the issue. As a result of that general convention, uh, I was a member of a committee called the Social and Urban Committee. In fact, if my memory serves me right, I believe I chaired it. And we came up with um, a resolution, uh, 2000, uh, A123, that calls call for changes. We brought that resolution back and our diocese started the work. One of the things that we worked on during my time was uh, anti-racism training for the clergy. Uh, that had sort of been haphazard in previous years, but the General Convention came along and said, clergy are required to do this. And so we got on board and, and all of our clergy went through the, through the training and we set up procedures to follow that and, and keep it up. So I went to Bishop Neal and said, it should be done better. And he said, then you become a member of the commission. And I said, I wasn't trying to get to do that. I, but he said, but if you don't like it, you get to participate in making it different. And so I volunteered to start teaching the Dismantling Racism class, which was called Anti-Racism. But I thought, we're the church. Why aren't we doing this uh, in that way? Where we're talking about this as spiritual formation, where we're looking at this as a part of our overall journey toward healing and wellness. And so I reimagined the training to make it Eucharist centered. So we began the training with the Eucharist instead of sort of apologetically doing a little prayer and then going off to do mostly just diversity stuff. What brought me and uh, encouraged my interest in the center is that Dr. Meeks was not talking about any one specific group working on this work. She was calling for us all to work on the work. We turned out to be the poster children, mainly because of Catherine's experience and her passion, uh, lifelong passion for the work. That, that turn, that change, shifted the energy toward the work in this diocese and has now become something that shifted the work across the whole church because people had not thought about the work as spiritual formation. They thought about it as social justice work or fixing systems, but not about being a part of your ongoing spiritual journey as much as showing up for services on Sunday. It's all a part of the same thing. And just making those kinds of changes shifted the energy. And, and then when Bishop Wright was elected bishop, he suggested that we might want a new name. Because anti-rate, anti just sounds like it doesn't invite people to want to do too much. And so we um, decided that we would change our name to a beloved community commission for dismantling racism. 
You remember the beloved community. It's that phrase that Dr. King popularized. It's the acknowledgement that practicing the love exemplified by Jesus of Nazareth can, has, will transform opposers into friends and bring about miracles in people's hearts. The beloved community seeks to describe that reality that good is created locally and cosmically when people practice Christian love through reconciliation and redemption. And that the practice of Christian love generates a unique goodwill that transforms old age gloom into new age exuberant gladness. And I was also asked, because the current chair was ready to retire from his work at Emory, and he didn't want to keep doing the chairship. And so I was asked if I wanted to be chair. I didn't really want to, but it's one of those things where I know how to do this probably better than most folks. I've got a vision about it, and I can do it. So if I want to be a good steward, I best guess I better say yes. In Macon, the first one, we had to go before the city council. One of the commissioners said, why do you want to bring that up? That happened a long time ago. You know, why do you want to do that? And there's, that's where that truth telling came in. I went before the council and I said, this happened. People need to know that this happened. The pilgrimages. That the Jonathan Daniels pilgrimages. Um, I can remember that first one we went to, we took a bus um, and went there, it was, bus was packed. Bishop was on the bus and um, it was just a wonderful experience for me. We said, after going to about two or three of those, we said, you know, there are a lot of things that happened in Georgia, yes, we know that there were lynchings that went on in Alabama, but there were also lynchings that went on in Georgia. Why can't we do some research and find out about those lynchings? And that's what happened. We would, first of all, find out the names of people who had been lynched in the area. And then we actually went before the uh, city council and found a space where we could put a plaque with the names of those people who were lynched. We found that out and wanted to place it in front of the Douglas Theater, which is a historic theater in Macon, owned by a black man, where uh, the body of a man who had been lynched was thrown. That was the first step. To stand in virtually in the same place where a human being was discarded. Now here you are, uh, in, in strength that we gather from one another and in courage that we get from Christ through reconciliation to stand virtually in the same place and to say, not us, not anymore. Uh, the second one was in Athens where we found more names of people. That was like the next year. We went to Athens, had a wonderful ceremony at the Baptist church there had a much larger plaque with more names on it. Actually, it was more like a monument. It was more than a plaque. And those names are still there in front of that um, historic church and school uh, in Athens, Georgia. Then the third year, of course, was here uh, with the huge monument of uh, oh, 600 names. And the, of course, there were, there were more than that. These are just the ones that could be documented. So that's, that's what happened. Also along with that came the center. I mean, this, this, this center was here, of course, located on uh, Student Movement Boulevard. But Catherine had a vision that this was the place we should do everything. It, it would be everything would be here.
Beside horror, uh, I think in this city, in lots of other cities, uh, lives hope. And, uh, and that's the part that really animates me and, uh, and was essential uh, in us thinking about the uh, Absalom Jones Center for Racial Reconciliation and Healing. It, it, we know what the world is. We know how it misses the mark. Now, what do we do? Uh, is guilt the best place to go? No. Is rage the best place to live? No. And so uh, we have in our faith uh, and we have in our, our wisdom uh, amongst one another and the power of the Holy Spirit, the ability to figure out how to move forward. We're on the campus of an HBCU, you know, consortium, right? Um, and, and this means that Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University, and Morehouse College are all around us, as well as Morris Brown um, and ITC. The fact that, that this work is, is, is being generated and is getting its life and its creativity and its energy uh, out of this area, you know, where so much of our civil rights history and so many of the personalities of our civil rights history, both uh, religiously and politically, you know, have a home here in Atlanta. And so the fact that this would, would kind of, you know, bubble up out of, out of our own context is, is hugely, hugely exciting, I think. The work of this center and of this diocese help us to create God's beloved community anew, which is nothing less than the very dream of God and the end of our nightmare. We wanted to make something that was multifunctional, that could serve as a VBS, but that wasn't limited to just Vacation Bible School, something that people could use all year round. The children's curriculum um, is really about helping children to see the world and all the people in it through the eyes of God and to see other people's belovedness, to recognize and celebrate differences in diversity, uh, to be able to see that sometimes the world is not how it should be and to have some ideas about what they can do when they see that the world is not as it should be. I'm gonna have many students telling me that, hey, I go to an HBCU, I only thought this, you know, racism thing was about African Americans. But when they come to the center, they recognize that racism is a little bit more far-reaching than that. Racism affects the indigenous, um, Asian Americans, uh, Latina and Latino people, um, as well as African Americans. And I think that is another piece to the impact of the center. Um, we help people understand how deep racism is and we give them the tools to uh, bridge that gap. And so for the students, um, that educational piece is really major because it helps to take them from this African-American uh, perspective of injustice and broadens it to so much more. Almost every time that we uh, run the curriculum, we have young people coming to us saying, why didn't I know this? Um, particularly in reference to history. <laughs> why didn't I know that this was what was happening in the world? I didn't know, like what I was seeing was just the tip of the iceberg, but there was so much below the waterline and the world that I was seeing didn't make sense until I understood some of this history. One of the beautiful things that I see about the youth who opt in to the curriculum, who decide to go through it, is they really want to change the world. I'm working to create a curriculum to create a uh, dismantle racism for uh, Latinx, so the uh, Latino community. It's been a long work. I've been there, I've been working on this for a couple of years but I'm still trying to get some information. I, I made a lot of meetings with uh, members of the Latino community, clergy and lay persons in the Episcopal Church in the, in the United States. Ideas like a white privilege or uh, internalized oppression uh, in, in the society nowadays. But after they have the training, they start to understand that they really exist. There is a, there, there is a white privilege that many white people doesn't understand is normal for them, but they don't understand that it's not normal for other people. And some other people on 
didn't understand what the internalized oppression means, and I think it's a crucial uh, definition because it's a still alive in our days, which is people understand the racism exists and accept it. We've seen the center start reaching out to different parts of the church and different areas of the church and more people across the Episcopal Church being parts of it. But not only that, we, I think we've got more of an ecumenical branch now where we're seeing other people from other faith groups that are partaking of what is happening here at the center. We do have a lot of uh, people coming here doing civil rights pilgrimages from various dioceses such as, uh, as uh, Iowa, um, uh, West uh, Virginia, uh, Western South, North Carolina, various dioceses doing uh, civil rights pilgrimages, and they always want to make a stop here at the center. And most times, you know, they'll have lunch or breakfast and they meet with Dr. Meeks and she'll talk with them, answer questions. We were trying to do a communications workshop, but also a reconciliation, a racial reconciliation workshop. And it was at that point when Catherine Mix started playing an important role because she helped us. And with these great women, we organized this racial reconciliation workshop that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when we sent a series of questions to all of the women who were going to participate so that they could tell the stories how the history goes back to the times of the colonization, how that marked and affected their lives forever. When we were in the workshop and the way that it evolved was wonderful to see how each woman was able to find and refine their roots. From that point on, Catherine was wonderful with us. She was always concerned with the follow-up. One of the most important things was that the center through the doctor, Dr. Catherine, really pays attention to you know, having interpretation and so that we could speak in Spanish and that it would be interpreted into English and that they had the opposite as well, back and forth, English and Spanish, so that the dialogue could flow because many times in Latin America, we are hearing interpretation into Spanish all the time. But this time we worked both ways and it was able, you, they, you guys were able to hear the voices of the Latin American sisters in that context. That was a beautiful opportunity and I think it was important for us. No place else in the Episcopal Church, and I didn't see any place else in, the, in any kind of Christian church in the United States, had the kind of focus on, on creative programming that this center did. And then guess what happened in 2020? Kaboom! All of our programs that have been take, taking place here uh, had to go on Zoom. It was the best thing that could have happened for the center. Each year since COVID, we've increased the number of people who participated in our programming. So it's, you know, it's thousands of people from all over the country. So it became a national ministry because of that. For a lot of people, it was a horrible thing. But for us, there was a, a really a good side. It was we could offer the training to people all over the United States and throughout the world. So that Zoom training is still continuing. I continue to be a trainer. Uh, Catherine is so, just expanded the vision unbelievably wide. You know, talk about draw the circle wide. Well, her vision was wide and it just has continued to be a wonderful thing that should never stop. Believe me, 
We have never left Jim Crow. There are systemic structures in place in American society that discriminate against blacks and other people of color in ways that have to be systemically dismantled if we're to become anywhere close to a beloved community. We need to stop to normalize racism as a joke, as a condition, as a social condition, as a decision makers to uh, select somebody or elect somebody. It feels like people are trying to go really backwards right now and I'm just grateful for the center and the kind of, I guess, the rootedness it has. And I would say in the last three or four years, as more has happened within the diocese and I think just throughout the country, people are now really eager for that information. We learned a lot in the prior political arena that was here in the United States, and it affected everybody. Some truths came out, and those truths coming out really show how important this work really is. There are many pieces to this work, is what I would like to say. And each piece has its value. And that, uh, above all, I think one of the, one of the sinews, the, the glue that can hold us together is the center, the Absalom Jones Center. The work of the center of these last six years is the first chapter and what I think will be a long story of the center's work and transformation of the entire Episcopal Church. And I think sometimes it's easy to, you know, to go to a workshop or, or to achieve a particular threshold of our uh, leadership or our, our uh, process around these things and somehow feel like we have finished. And yet that work is a long way from being done. The way to have a full inclusion and uh, remove the racism from the history uh, is, a, is a long way. We have a lot of stuff to do yet. It just, the vision continues. It's not going to go away. We're going to continue to do this until the day we die. We now see, because of Dr. Meek's leadership, congregations and dioceses across the Episcopal Church working with the center, using its resources and their own inner work and their own transformation in community. I'm eager to be part of that. I'm really excited about meeting and connecting with people who are also brave. There are so many people who watch the news and sit in their seats and think to themselves, what do I do? How can I help? How can I support? And I'm excited to see the center um, continue to be a beacon of hope and change so that people understand how to connect with our resources and how to um, be courageous. My hope is that every time I do a training, that someone walks away with a little bit of self-reflection and that they will know that we're all children of God. We're called to love each other. And if we spread just a little bit of that love to each other, we can heal this racial divide. I have every hope. One being the commitment this diocese has always made to this work. And I know that they will make sure it continues. So I have no doubt about that whatsoever. I also believe because of that work, we also have encouraged and supported a perspective and a feeling throughout the diocese that of people who want this work. If the, we were to back off, I think there would be a demand for it which speaks a lot to what has been accomplished in the last, you know, 12, 13 years. My greatest hope is that one day it'll be unnecessary. That's my greatest hope, that we will do the work as a church and, and that this kind of work will be unnecessary. But until it's unnecessary, I'm hoping that it will continue the message of that to be brave in this work and to be open to wherever the spirit takes you is really the way to get the work done. It's not about do we have the, the most fancy this or that or can we figure out some slick way to talk about race so folks don't know we're talking about race. That's nonsense stuff. We need to talk about can we, how can we be honest and willing to be pilgrims together, to, 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 do, to be open to the energy that can bring healing and I hope that the, the next iterations of this work, however 
it unfolds will make that easier and better and clearer and that folks will step up to the plate. So we are at a, an important intersection in uh, the Epsom Jones Center. Our, our beloved Catherine uh, is leaving at the end of 2023 and uh, we are actively searching right now for her successor. Uh, someone who can uh, take what they have been given, which is an awful lot from Catherine's work, a lot of good cheer, a lot of partnership, and figure out how to take that forward. And so I'm actually very excited about that. I think one of the things that we want to do going forward is, is to remember that the Absalom Jones Center is actually located uh, at, the, uh, at the Atlanta University Center, uh, where we have Atlanta Clark University, where we have Morehouse College and Spelman University. And so, Spelman College. And so, it's, it's wonderfully situated to not only look back at the history of racism and um, grassroots organizing, but it's wonderfully situated to talk about what leadership looks like going forward uh, as we face uh, some of these hard to dislodge problems in our culture, like racism, like sexism, like xenophobism, uh, ageism, etc. And so, I'm excited about what comes next. We've had a marvelous first chapter with Catherine. Thank God for her pioneering work uh, at the Absalom Jones Center. But now, who will she pass the baton to? That's what I'm excited about. We will all remember and celebrate her vision, her courage, her unbelievable energy, and her uh, determination to continue with the work, even at times when physically she might not have felt up to it. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's always, when you have a charismatic leader of a nonprofit, the transition is always uh, a little scary. But I think that Catherine has done such good work in establishing this as the foremost center for racial healing in the Episcopal Church, that we're gonna be able to attract a great executive director to follow her. That person will stand on her shoulders. That person will be building on the legacy she's built. I hope that we can find uh, new people, not just one Catherine. We need a lot of Catherines uh, in every single person who get the commitment to work with us in the Absalom Jumps Healing Center. It needs to be uh, somehow some kind of Catherine with the same commitment and the same desires to have a better society and remove the racism. So that doesn't make any sense nowadays. We are in the 20th century. We need to normalize the inclusion in all the levels. Because at the end, we are a church. We are the Episcopal Church. And we need to understand that even that we cannot love our neighbors as much as God loves us, we have to do our best. This is a word for oppressor and oppressed alike. Each week in our churches, we come together to remember Christ's life, death, and resurrection, all of it. We do this so that we can hear and know and trust that pain and guilt and shame won't, don't have the last word. That though we may be found culpable, some of us, there is therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And that though we have colluded with systems of oppression, where the spirit is now, there is liberty, whether victim or oppressor. This is the opportunity of tonight, that remembering the past and then remembering God's ability to make gold out of garbage, we press on. So enveloped in the durable belovedness that flows first from God and then from person to person, the beloved community takes some risks together. We pledge to see together. And we pledge to allow what has been undiscussable to now be discussed.